Still unhappy racing the Melbourne Way, broke the record in the Ascot Vale Stakes at Flemington today and AJC Derby winner Durbridge back to winning form. Earlier, however, the first was taken by foreign agent, the steeplechase at tens over Trismo and Iron Gate. Race two went to Barrakee, back from fives into three to one, equal favourite, and he made it two in a row. The third to Natchez, easy in the betting, but an overdue win with Darren Gouchy on board. Race four was the first leg of the quaddy. Lord Chicton coming at them, three across the track. It's on the outside now, uh, going to the front here narrowly. Lord Chicton, the Hippogriff, fighting on, but Lord Chicton's won it from the Hippogriff. Mountain Rulers third. Lord Chicton at 9 to 2 gave Stephen King a double, the Hippogriff at 7 second, Mountain Rule the 6 to 4 favourite, a bit disappointing. Most partners reasoned the Craig Lee to be a battle between Citizen and Dr Grace, the two who quinelled the Liston. There was money for Kesem and a little for Durbridge, the AJC Derby winner, who jumped to the front and that was it. Below the 300, Durbridge by two, Prince Celieri's out. Dr Grace called on, not going on. And it's Durbridge in front of the 200. Two lengths in front and holding Prince Celieri. Kessam and Citizen down the outside. But Durbridge finds his best form on firm going. And Durbridge wins two lengths, Prince Celieri. Getting up for third, Citizen in front of Dr Grace. The firmer track and regain fitness the difference. And trainer Brian Murphy now has Durbridge geared for the Cox Plate. Provided he's competitive at weight for age, and I think he must be, uh, it'll be weight for age. The Caulfield Cup is only an option if we're not competitive at weight for age. And a clever ride it was today by Greg Hall to get Durbridge home at 10s over Prince Salieri and Citizen. Dr Grace a disappointing favourite. Sydney Colt Terse had made improvements since his Caulfield win, but it was his first run down the straight. Still, bookies took no gamble. They sent the chestnut out seven to four on. Outside, a noble lancer in blinkers for the first time ran the race of his life and nearly scored the first big upset of the spring. 350 metres to go, Noble Lancer in front of Prince of Praise and Terse is trying to squeeze up on a needle eye opening. Terse has given a slap of the whip to come out after Noble Lancer at the 200 metre mark. Noble Lancer about a half in front. Terse, Dyer's working overtime on him. Dyer's coming home on Terse now, but it's Noble Lancer by ahead. Terse with courage, pokes his head in front end. Terse has got up to win it from Noble Lancer. Falling so away third as did he do it. Terse isn't yet handling the Melbourne way of going, yet he broke the Ascot Vale record, impressing Shane Dye. Yeah, he's such a tremendous fighter and he's got a great will to win and really he should have got beat today if he was going to get beat. He had things against him and he hung very bad once I went for him and he was going to the line three quarter pace because I couldn't let him go because he was going to run straight out so it was just an outstanding win. The Bill Stutt stakes at Mooney Valley in a fortnight is next and Dye says if he wins that he won't be beaten in the Cox Plate. The Bobby Lewis, the sprint next, wraparound favourite. Under the whip at Street Ruffian, the leader from St Jude. Wraparound's working into it from Premier Copper. Street Ruffian in front of the 200 metre mark from St Jude. And then Premier Copper followed by Wraparound. Street Ruffian still in front of the 100. Premier Copper the challenger. Street Ruffian by a length. Keep going, Street Ruffian, he's home. And Street Ruffian beats Premier Copper. Two lengths away, third, either Rekabite or our Dawn Star, which flashed up from... Street Ruffian is really racing well for Shane Dye, who scored a double on the easing 15 to 1 charts. And the last today went to... Shavano Miss, who led all the way over Reno's Bell, let Salope getting third on protest. Daily double today, 8 and 3, 92 75. Extra 3 and 10, $11.50. The quad rudder, $732.35. A nice quad extra, $1,627 even. And nobody picked the last six winners today. That'll jackpot to Flemington on Wednesday. So we'll have a crack at that Wednesday soon. Good. OK, thanks, Greg. See okay. you tomorrow. Right. And now to the window. Good evening. Hawthorne goes into its eighth grand final in nine years after a thrilling win over Geelong in the second semi-final. The Hawks were in control early but dreadfully inaccurate, while the second half became a hard slog right to the final siren. With Brereton and Dippy Air Domenico watching on, Hawthorne led Geelong to the ball for the majority of the first half but kicked atrociously. Tony Hall was a notable exception, bagging a couple. That was until this incident, a cat's going in ferociously. As a result, Hall came off. Earlier, Bill Brownless was booked, with veteran Michael Tuck on the receiving end. Geelong never looked like scoring until Neville Bruns burst clear. Wide open for Neville Bruns. Two against two on the forward line. Bruns might do it himself. And against the trend of play, kicks a goal. The intense physical nature of the contest was still evident. Brownless kicked two goals in the second quarter, but didn't look fully fit. Hawthorne maintained its control around the ground but continued to let itself down in the goal front. 19 scoring shots to seven, and the Hawks only three goals up. Geelong's on ball players lifted. Gary Hocking, who'd been busy throughout the afternoon, provided the impetus. 
Mark Neild was also inspirational, while Barry Stoneham was authoritative Tries overhead. Stoneham the target this time. He's got it! The Cats suffered a blow midway through the third quarter, losing Bill Brownless with a hamstring injury. Jason Dunstall, who's been held goalless, chipped in with a couple, and the Hawks were one point down at three-quarter time. In the final term, the football field became a battle zone. Not only was Ken Hinckley crunched, but Andrew Buse hurt his hand. Darren Pritchard injured his hip. Chris Mew was down, and Stephen Lawrence looked poppy. Players on both sides were tired, but it was Geelong's turn to be inaccurate. Something extraordinary was required to break the deadlock. Darren Jarman accommodated, and the Hawks clung on to win a thriller by two points. The Hawks into another grand final. Hawthorne now has a week's rest, while Geelong has to play the winner of tomorrow's game in next week's preliminary final. And Bill Brownless's hamstring isn't his only worry. He has an appointment with the tribunal. With little to celebrate in the seniors this season, the Bears reserves have had a much better year. Today they defeated minor premiers Collingwood to move straight into the grand final. The West Coast Eagles flew out of Perth this afternoon for their do or die first semi-final clash against Melbourne tomorrow. The Eagles took with them the footballing hopes of most of the West resting on their shoulders. And going on this year's form, the Eagles go into tomorrow's game as favourites. Some say the trip to Melbourne will take the Eagles away from the hype in Perth and allow them to concentrate more on the vital match. A barely extended Jeff Fennec took an important step last night towards a fourth world title, defeating Argentinian Miguel Francia in a non-title bout in Melbourne. And the other good news, as he prepares for the Azuma Nelson rematch in December, Fennec's hands passed the test. Jeff Fennick took three rounds to settle into his homecoming bout against Argentinian Miguel Francia. Super featherweight Francia, ranked fifth in the world, fought blow for blow, but was unable to dent Fennick's unblemished record. Fennick quickly introduced the Argentinian visitor to the lethal combinations he's renowned for. Francia showed strength and aggression as he kept up with the triple world champion, but the Marrickville Mauler continued to bore in. Sheer determination prevented Fennec from knocking Francia to the canvas. The Argentinian fought to stay on his feet. In the 10th, Fennec hit Francia with left and rights to the head. There was still plenty of fight in the courageous Argentinian. Francia began counter-punching the Australian. Fennec's strength to stay was visible as they went the distance. Yeah, well, I think I needed this fight, and, you know, against Azuma Nelson, I finished strong, and in this fight, I finished strong. My timing's definitely not here, but I'll have a good couple of weeks off now, and I'm sure I'll come back bigger and better than ever. Hands OK? Hands are good, and I just look forward to getting back here in December, and I know you will all watch me fight, Nelson. Thank you. Promoter Bill Morty says the Azuma Nelson rematch in December will be at an out-of-doors venue in Melbourne, catering for 35,000 fans. A late wind change has prevented the Port Cedar Port Hastings yacht race winner, Cotton Blossom, from breaking the course record. And the race had some casualties with three yachts running onto rocks. The 180-year-old race attracted its best ever field, but not all of the 117 entrants adapted to the conditions. The favourite, Shenandoah, was disqualified for a premature start. Then, along with two other yachts, it became a victim of the notorious Corsair rocks. Once the field settled in, St Kilda 50-footer Animal Farm set the pace. But it all came to an end with a mast problem. At the halfway mark, Cotton Blossom from Brighton took advantage of the injured Animal Farm. Both yachts were well on target to break the 46 nautical mile course record. But 10 miles from Hastings, the wind breeze dropped dramatically from 30 knots to 18. That put the winner, Cotton Blossom, 10 minutes and 19 seconds outside. Second over the line was Animal Farm, followed by Payne's Wessex from Geelong. To racing and Terse, although still unhappy racing the Melbourne Way, broke the record in the Ascot Vale Stakes at Flemington today. And AJC Derby winner Durbridge back to winning form. Earlier, however, the first was taken by foreign agent, the steeplechase at tens over Trismo and Iron Gate. Race two went to Barrakee, back from fives into three to one, equal favourite, and he made it two in a row. The third to Natchez, easy in the betting, but an overdue win with Darren Gouchy on board. Race four was the first leg of the quaddy. Lord Chicton coming at them, three across the track. It's on the outside now, uh, going to the front here narrowly. Lord Chicton, the hippogriff, fighting on, but Lord Chicton's won it from the hippogriff. Mountain Rawler's third. Lord Chicton at 9-2 gave Stephen King a double, the Hippogriff at 7-2nd, Mountain Rule the 6-4 favourite, a bit disappointing. 
Most punters reasoned the Craigley to be a battle between Citizen and Dr Grace, the two who quenelled the Liston. There was money for Kesem and a little for Durbridge, the AJC Derby winner, who jumped to the front and that was it. Below the 300, Durbridge by two, Prince Celieri's out. Dr Grace called on, not going on. And it's Durbridge in front of the 200. Two lengths in front and holding Prince Celieri. Kesem and Citizen down the outside. But Durbridge finds his best form on firm going. And Durbridge wins two lengths, Prince Celieri. Getting up for third, Citizen in front of Dr Grace. The firmer track and regain fitness the difference. And trainer Brian Murphy now has Durbridge geared for the Cox Plate. Provided he's competitive weight for age, and I think he must be, uh, it'll be weight for age. The Caulfield Cup is only an option if we're not competitive at weight for age. And a clever ride it was today by Greg Hall to get Durbridge home at 10s over Prince Salieri and Citizen. Dr Grace a disappointing favourite. Sydney Colt Terse had made improvement since his Caulfield win, but it was his first run down the straight. Still, bookies took no gamble. They sent the chestnut out seven to four on. Outside a noble lancer in blinkers for the first time, ran the race of his life and nearly scored the first big upset of the spring. 350 metres to go, Noble Lancer in front of Prince of Praise and Terse is trying to squeeze up on a needle eye opening. Terse has given a slap of the whip to come out after Noble Lancer at the 200 metre mark. Noble Lancer about a half in front. Terse, Dyer's working overtime on him. Dyer's coming home on Terse now, but it's Noble Lancer by ahead. Terse with courage, pokes his head in front end. Terse has got up to win it from Noble Lancer. Four lengths away, third as did he do it. Terse isn't yet handling the Melbourne way of going, yet he broke the Ascot Vale record, impressing Shane Dye. Yeah, he's such a tremendous fighter and he's got a great will to win and really he should have got beat today if he was going to get beat. He had things against him and he hung very bad once I went for him and he was going to the line three quarter pace because I couldn't let him go because he was going to run straight out so it was just an outstanding win. The Bill Stutt Stakes at Mooney Valley in a fortnight is next and Dye says if he wins that he won't be beaten in the Cox Plate. The Bobby Lewis, the sprint next, wraparound favourite. Under the whip at Street Ruffian, the leader from St Jude. Wraparound's working into it from Premier Copper. Street Ruffian in front of the 200 metre mark from St Jude. And then Premier Copper followed by Wraparound. Street Ruffian still in front of the 100. Premier Copper, the challenger. Street Ruffian by a length. Keep going, Street Ruffian, he's home. And Street Ruffian beats Premier Copper. Two lengths away, third, either Rechabite or our Dawn Star, which flashed up from... Street Ruffian is really racing well for Shane Dye, who scored a double on the easing 15 to 1 charts. And the last today went to Shivano Miss, who led all the way over Reno's Bell, let's elope getting third on protest. Daily double today, 8 and 3, 92 75. Extra 3 and 10, $11.50. The uh, Quad Rudder, $732.35. A nice quad extra, $1,627 even. And nobody picked the last six winners today. That'll jackpot to Flemington on Wednesday. So we'll have a crack at that Wednesday soon. Good. OK, thanks, Reg. See okay. you tomorrow. Right. And now to the weather. Around Victoria, conditions were fine, apart from isolated showers about the northeast ranges. Temperatures were mostly in the range of 15 to 19 degrees, but a few degrees higher in the Mallee. The highest recorded temp was 24 at Mildura. In Melbourne, it reached a lovely 19 degrees at 3.30, after a low of 10 at 2 a.m. The synoptic chart shows a high-pressure ridge over the Tasman Sea. A complex low system in the Bight is moving slowly east. Eastward. And that low over the bite will continue to move eastward and will influence the weather over Victoria for the remainder of the weekend. Now to the forecasts and around Australia, possible showers in Canberra but easing in Perth, fine in most other capitals. A little patchy rain extending from the west overnight, then clearing during tomorrow. A mild day with moderate to fresh northerly winds tending west to northwesterly. A strong wind warning is current for coastal waters west of Cape Otway. Now on to Victoria. Fine at first, but patchy rain developing from the west overnight before easing to a few showers in the west tomorrow. And these are the expected temperatures for tomorrow in Victorian regional centres. 23 in Albury, that's really getting up there. Now onto the bays, northerly winds at 10 to 15 knots, freshing to 15 to 20 knots overnight, waves to around one metre. For Melbourne, fine tonight, cloudy tomorrow with a little rain at times, a low of 10 and a high of 17. The three-day outlook, Monday a shower too, about 17. Tuesday showers windy, about 14. Wednesday showers, about 14 also. And now our main stories again. Croatian forces report major setbacks on several fronts. Australians keeping the peace in North Africa. And Hawthorne secures its eighth great grand final berth in nine years. 
And that's ABC News for now. Our mid-evening update tonight about 25 past nine. And join me again tomorrow night at seven o'clock for our next major bulletin. But for now, from us, good night.